Peter Pan's Flight, one of the most cherished attractions at Disneyland. Anyone who doubts this ride's significance to the park or to its visitors obviously hasn't noticed the long lines out front in the hot summer sun, often garnering 35 to 75 minute waits. And most of the folks waiting in line are adults. If that doesn't speak volumes about this ride, I don't know what will. This attraction was allegedly one of Walt Disney's favorites as well, and I can see why. Walt Disney's animated film Peter Pan was released to theaters in 1953, just two years before he opened Disneyland, and it saw a box office success which was comparable to his films Cinderella and Pinocchio. Walt was a huge fan of the story of Peter Pan since a play came to his boyhood town of Marceline, Missouri, and since then, he never forgot that deep-seated desire to fly over London and Neverland. During the planning for Disneyland, Walt put Imagineer Bill Martin in charge of overseeing the design of Fantasyland. One of the attractions that Walt wanted was a dark ride with Peter Pan where guests could fly over various landmarks from the story. Imagineer Herb Ryman created a basic layout concept in May of 1954, which was then adjusted and redrawn by Imagineer Marvin Davis in August of that year. And using that design, Art director Bill Martin completed the tentative track layout designs that November. Imagineer Bob Gurr recalled, Bill was like an architect, art director, show writer, a jack of all trades. He could take a big plan view and make a drawing and not only visualize how everything would look, but how it would look in 3D. The Imagineers were tossing around ideas about what the ride vehicles should look like. Eventually, the artists agreed on a pirate galleon, which flew with the magic of Tinkerbell's pixie dust. The teams that were building Disneyland didn't have much time to design Fantasyland. Many of them would have to move on to helping with Tomorrowland. The building that the Peter Pan ride would take place in was an ordinary soundstage-like building, but with strong steel girders to support the roof. To make the guests fly over the attraction sets, the Imagineers selected the Cleveland Tramrail Company because they built motorized overhead trams and cranes for manufacturing and other industries. The specific mechanism used for driving the vehicles is one of Tramrail Company's standard monorail cranes, only it was modified to support a ride vehicle and not an electric winch. The motor that drives the monorail crane was a single one horsepower electric motor that rode along a track that was bolted directly to the steel roof girders and electrified in block sections. No two ride vehicles can be in the same block section or else the safety systems would shut down the whole attraction, requiring a reset. One of the benefits of a monorail crane is that it can go up and down steep inclines. However, the Peter Pan attraction at Disneyland would have inclines steep enough to really test the limits of what the little cranes could do. The ride vehicles were sculpted by studio artist Chris Mweller. A small model was used so Chris could sculpt a life-size ride vehicle 7 feet long and 4.5 and feet wide. The life-size sculpt was used to mold the ride vehicle's shell out of fiberglass. The Imagineers at the Disney Studio ended up building 10 of these ride vehicles, and all they had to do was bolt them to the monorail crane. One of the defining features of the pirate ships was their ability to sway on the track, giving more movement as the boat swung around turns. This would later cause a problem, as Bob Gurr reported that kids used to try to make the vehicles sway as far as they could. One vehicle even stopped the attraction when its lap bar release pedal got lodged in the drywall of the ride. Imagineers Ken Anderson and Claude Coates were put in charge of designing and building most of the ride's sets right there in the park without too much previous planning. Thankfully though, they had both worked on the Peter Pan movie just two years before and already had a good idea for the set design and story layout. Unfortunately, as the money for Fantasyland ran out, they couldn't fully theme the area with a village courtyard. Instead, only the two buildings immediately to the left and right of the castle were given a Bavarian village appearance. The rest of the dark ride entrances were given a medieval fair theme with cheap facades made of brightly painted canvas tents and wooden walls. Before anyone knew it, time had run out and Disneyland was set to open. The Peter Pan attraction hadn't been fully completed yet. They didn't even have time to complete the elevated floor in the loading area. This was important because since the ride vehicles were designed to sway, they needed the slot in the floor to stabilize the bottom of the vehicle while guests climbed aboard. Instead, they made do with a wooden step stool and had a ride operator standing by to hold the vehicle steady while passengers stepped in. 
At the loading area, the monorail track sits 8 feet 9 inches above the ground. And throughout the flight over London, the track leads further upward to its maximum height of 16 feet 9 inches above the floor, which means that the passengers are never more than 10 feet in the air, give or take a foot. In 1955, once you boarded your pirate ship, the ride started forward and took guests into a rather empty version of the bedroom of Wendy, Michael, and John, before passing through the window and climbing higher above London. Next, you soar even higher as the ship flew towards Tinkerbell, who spun in circles excitedly marking the way into the stars towards Neverland. The original model of Neverland was about 15 feet long and built on a platform sitting two feet off the ground amid a star field. Through the use of blacklight paint, the model glowed in the darkness when illuminated with ultraviolet light. Next, you made a turn through the left eye of Skull Rock and entered the caverns where you tried to rescue Princess Tiger Lily as Captain Hook and Smee attempt to shoot you down. And suddenly, your vehicle passes through a doorway and you are back at the loading area. The ride duration was only two minutes long, but nevertheless, it was like nothing you'd ever seen before at an amusement park, and the feeling you felt as you exited was pure joy. Bob Gurr noted that the original ride system was very noisy, and the swaying of the ride vehicles was far too pronounced. But the main complaint about the attraction wasn't the noise or the movement, but rather the lack of actually seeing Peter Pan on the ride. When the original Fantasyland Dark Rides debuted at Disneyland, the idea was that you were the main character experiencing the adventure. So when you flew over London on a pirate ship, you were Peter Pan. Though this concept never translated well to the guests. So in the year 1957, the attraction was remodeled. The vehicle sculpt was redone. The swaying of the vehicles was given a limited degree of motion. And finally, Peter Pan was featured on the ride. A more expensive refurbishment project was done in 1960 by a team of Imagineers led by Yale Gracie. All the scenes were rebuilt and repainted with more details, props, and characters. Bob Gurr oversaw the replacement of the track and vehicle power with a much quieter system. The attraction received minor upgrades and scenery refreshes over the years, but none were more prominent than the one given during the construction of New Fantasyland back in 1982. During this refurbishment, all of the ride vehicles were replaced with newer versions that were built slightly wider by 6 inches. Tony Baxter and his team were also adamant that all the scenes in the attraction had to be redone, but still hold true to the experience given since 1955. The first thing they wanted to do was make the ride longer. Thankfully, they were satisfied with the current layout of the ride path. All they needed to do was extend it. The front wall and loading area of the building was removed in order to gut the show scenes like the model of Neverland and the Caverns of Skull Rock. The exterior tents and banners were replaced with a new facade themed to an English village with a clock tower. They expanded the children's bedroom and gave it more detail. Then they built a new model of Neverland with better trees, rocks, and other features including a more detailed version of the native village. Then the ship would fly past Skull Rock to see Princess Tiger Lily in the water. The finale of the ride was extended and featured a new scene where Peter Pan and Captain Hook have a sword fight aboard the Jolly Roger, and the rest is pretty familiar with you already. All in all, with the new additions and finale, they managed to extend the length of the ride by a whopping 20 seconds. There's some things I need to clear up with these new show scenes. First of all, the Jolly Roger ship is not the same one from the Captain Hook's galley pirate ship. This one here is less than half the size, and no, it doesn't feature any props salvaged from the other ship. There was one prop that I can confirm is from the old restaurant, the hook from the sign out front. It was saved and placed in the new exit of Peter Pan's flight. The ride received another refresh in time for Disneyland's 50th anniversary in 2005, which included painting one of the pirate ships gold to represent that it was an opening day attraction. And the most recent change to the attraction came in time for the 60th anniversary of Disneyland in 2015, where the children in the nursery were now levitating with pixie dust, and Tinkerbell and Peter Pan's shadow was upgraded with new projection effects. In the London scene, the River Thames was given a new special effect, and the clock tower has new projections as well. The second star to the right also bursts with magic as you approach Neverland, which can be seen with a fresh new coat of paint, water effects, lava effects, and an LED star field surrounding it. 
More water effects can be seen in the next scene, as well as new pixie dust effects when Peter Pan starts to fly the ship into the sky. It's no secret that the ride suffers from poor hourly capacity, only able to handle about 700 people per hour, which is nothing compared to the Haunted Mansion's 2,800 hourly capacity. Over the last five years, there have been occasional rumors of future plans to try to double that number, but that is yet to be officially announced. After all these years, there's only two props in the whole ride that are still original from 1955. The dog Nana, and the statue of Admiral Nelson. Everything else in the ride has been either replicated or replaced over the decades. Peter Pan's flight has survived all these years, not only because the story is still a family favorite, but also because the design of the attraction. Instead of being confined to the ground, you are lifted into the air. Instead of swerving through a tight maze of show scenes, you glide smoothly through spacious areas. Not to mention, the classic movie music plays throughout the different scenes, making for a truly wonderful experience. The feeling you get when you climb aboard that pirate galleon as it whisks you off into the clouds is unforgettable. For a moment, you can suspend disbelief and truly believe you are on your merry way to Never Never Land. This attraction has proven not only that it can withstand the test of time, but that it can transcend through generations. This year, Peter Pan's flight celebrates 65 years of magic and make-believe. Author Ray Bradbury, a personal friend of Walt Disney, had visited Disneyland during the first season of Operation in 1955. He stood in line like the other joyful visitors and rode the attraction. He later wrote a message to Walt Disney. It read, I will be eternally grateful, for today I flew out of a child's bedroom on a pirate galleon on my way to the stars.